Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we rest in your hands. Uh, Father, all the things going on, the, the tragedies of this past week, the, the serious accident uh, where just a young child just was immediately ushered into your presence. Uh, Father, every day is a gift. Each breath that you give us is an opportunity. May we share your love. May we reach out in, in kindness, in mercy, in grace to a world that knows so little about that. I pray, Father, that uh, as we gather this morning, as we look at your word, that you'll teach us, that you'll challenge us, encourage our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I know when we say amen, we usually sit down, stay up. We're going to read a section of scripture, Romans chapter 1. I'm going to start in verse 4, uh, chapter 10. I'm going to start in verse 10 and go through verse 21. Romans 10, verse 14 through 21. Did I say that the same way twice? All right. Romans 10, 14. Let you follow along. I'm reading uh, from my Bible, uh, the King James, here this morning. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of great joy. Verse 16 now of Romans 10. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First, Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. And by a foolish nation I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that ask not after me. But to Israel, he saith, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you. You may be seated. As we continue in Romans, uh, keep in mind that these three chapters, chapters 9, 10, and 11, are focused primarily upon the nation of Israel, and they are dealing with the question of the fact that Israel has rejected her Messiah, the fact that Israel seems to be under God's chastening hand, under God's judgment. And if Jesus is the Messiah, if Israel is the chosen nation, and if God is faithful to his promises, why did Israel reject Jesus? Why is Israel under Roman oppression? And why, in just a few more years after the writing of this, why would Israel be scattered through all the nations? And so Paul is responding to that issue. Why does it seem that God has forgotten Israel? Were his promises valid? So far, Paul has stressed that personal salvation, an individual's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, an individual's faith in God, more generally, to go back to Old Testament terms, a person's faith in God has always been a matter of God's grace and sovereignty. It has never been true throughout all history, throughout the Old Testament history, throughout the time of the Exodus, the wanderings, throughout the conquest of the land, the possession of the land, uh, the judges, the prophets, the kings. It has never been true through that period that all Israelites have been saved. Now, they had this mindset and they had this idea that simply because I'm a Jew, I'm okay. Do you think there are people who sometimes have that mindset today? Maybe because I'm a Baptist or maybe because I'm a Methodist or a Catholic or whatever they may happen to be. They have this mindset that because of that situation, because of that membership or identification, that somehow they are good to go with God. And the lesson is just as true for all of us today as it was for the nation of Israel. It's a matter of personal 
responsibility before God, a matter of personal faith, and that relates to God's sovereignty. Back in chapter 9, verse 6, one of the verses that, that we've looked at, that's probably been, I don't know, maybe eight, nine, ten weeks ago because we were out some and then Christmas and all of that. But one of the things it says is that they're not all Israel, which are all, uh, which are all Israel. And what he's saying is not everybody is a true Israelite by faith who genetically and by family and by descent might be a Jew. And he's stressing that it's always been a matter of God's grace and God's mercy. And then toward the end of the chapter and into chapter 10, he emphasizes personal faith and personal response to God. Now, there will be a time when all Israel will be saved. Go to Jeremiah 31. Hold, hold Romans 10 and go back to Jeremiah. You've got Isaiah, Jeremiah, the major prophets. If you hit Psalms, just go a little bit past that. Jeremiah 31. Pick up with me in verse 31. Jeremiah 31, 31. This is where the promise of the new covenant begins. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I... What's that next word? Although I was a husband. Is was present tense or past tense? How many of y'all have ever heard someone say, maybe not directly, but maybe give the indication that if you've ever been divorced, you can't ever do nothing for God. You can't be a preacher, you can't be a deacon, you can't be a Sunday school teacher. How many of y'all ever heard someone kind of come across with that kind of an idea? In fact, we'll barely even talk to you, almost. The reality is that God is divorced. God put away Israel and Judah because of their unfaithfulness. The nation of Israel was unfaithful to God. They were idolatrous, and that idolatry involved all kind of stuff. And God called them back to himself until finally God says, I put you away. And there are a couple of references where God says that he divorced Israel and Judah. Now, I don't say that to try to lower your opinion of God. Do you remember what kind of a man Joseph was? We, we, I don't recall if we looked at these verses because I wasn't here during this time. I was in the hospital and recovering. But we read the story of Joseph and Mary. And Mary was with child. And Joseph knew it wasn't his. And Joseph was going to divorce Mary because he was a wicked man? No, because he was what kind of a man? A just man, a righteous man. Because he was a just man, he was going to put her away. Because he couldn't be involved and in, in be identified with that kind of thing. Of course, God spoke to him and said, look, this is me. You, you marry her. And he did. Interestingly, though, although he was a just man and going to divorce her, he was going to do it quietly. You know why? Because in addition to his justice, he was also a gracious and kind man. He did not want to hurt her. He did not want to drag her name through the mud. But from all he knew at that point, he could not marry her because she was carrying another man's child. God spoke to him and said, don't you worry. This is a miracle. I did this. Joseph said, okay, you got it. You know what we have a hard time doing sometimes? We have a hard time sometimes balancing out our love for truth and our love for justice with compassion. I've missed that sometimes in my commitment to the truth of the word of God and my determination not to water it down, not to waver on that. I've not always been able to find the balance between truth and mercy. 
And that's not an easy balance to find. But I'm going to tell you, I'm at the point in my life now where if I'm going to fall off one side, and, and I want to keep the balance, but if I'm going to fall off one side, I want to fall off on the love, mercy, and grace side. If I'm going to be wrong, I'd rather be wrong leaning that way and drawing people to the Savior's love rather than to be wrong on the side of justice and pushing them away in judgment. Do we see that? The reality is there is one judge, but it's not us. Well, sorry, I got off track on that. God says, although I was a husband, God put them away, but God will restore the relationship. Back here in Jeremiah 31, verse 33 but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. And verse 31 again calls it the new covenant. I will make a new covenant. Verse 33, this is the covenant with the house of Israel. I will put my law in their inward parts, write it in their hearts, into verse 33, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Remember referring back when we were in chapter 9 to Hosea? Hosea married Gomer and she turned out to be a, a harlot, a whore. And after she went all the way to the bottom of the barrel and was underneath the barrel, Hosea went and bought her back on the auction, the slave auction. And Hosea said, you will be my wife and I will be your husband and you'll no longer fool around you're only for me. And then he says this, and I'm only for you. Understand this. God's love and grace comes to every one of us when we're at the bottom of the barrel. And he draws us to himself. And he says, I want you for me. And I will be for you. And so that's what God is doing with Israel. In spite of all her... Now, where's Israel now? Still in that state of rebellion. Incidentally, I did mention one, uh, hit one more thing before I get too far from it. There is an unpardonable sin. Divorce is not it. Even if you're the guilty party. God's grace is there. And so we never reach a point where we cannot come back and cast ourselves upon his grace and mercy. Now, is that the best thing? I think most of the time reconciliation should always be sought. It's a lot tougher to rebuild a relationship that's been damaged, but it demonstrates the grace and mercy and love of God at such a deeper level. To forgive someone who has hurt us so deeply. Because that's what God's forgiveness is for us, huh? So anyhow, we must never sit in judgment of anybody else. There is a judge, it's not us. Anyhow, back to the text here. Sorry, I'm sidetracking a lot here. God says, I'll put my law in their hearts. I'll be their God, they'll be my people. Verse 34, and this is the key part. They shall no more teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, know the Lord. See, no, no longer will they have to be saying, let me tell you about God. Why not? Middle of verse 34, for they shall, how many? They shall all know me. See, there will come a time when all Israel will be drawn to her Savior. Zechariah 12, 10, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced and they shall mourn as one mourns for his only son. They will recognize that Jesus is their Messiah when they see him coming in power and glory and they will come to him. They shall all know me. And how is that that they will know him? Verse goes on. For I, last part of verse 34, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. You know what we want to do? We want to forgive people, but we kind of want to hold on to what they've done. We kind of want to hold on to the hurt that we carry. And I understand that deep hurts are very, very hard to let go, and some deep hurts you will never get over. And I do understand that, all right? But what we must not do is to try to live in the misery of that hurt. Rather, we focus on God's grace and God's love and God's mercy in forgiving us and sustaining us and carrying us through whatever we've been through. 
and God's grace will lead us on. And, and I'll never forget hearing Corey Ten Boom uh, reading of an account where she saw one of the prison guards who had hurt her, who had humiliated her, and she remembered him, and her mind went back to those events while she was in the, in the, uh, the, the prison camp, the concentration camp. And she went up to that man and she hugged him. And she said it was not her that did that, but it was the grace of God flowing through her. And the, the guard, former prison guard, Nazi guard recognized her and he says, don't you remember me? And she says, yes, I do. And he says, don't you remember the hurt and the pain I caused you? And she says, I distinctly remember forgetting that. I like that. I distinctly remember forgetting that. See, we cannot undo a memory. But what we can do is to choose to move ahead in grace and forgiveness and mercy and rest in that. And that's the basis for God's restoration of Israel I will forgive their iniquity. I will remember their sins no more. Go back to Romans, only go a little bit past 10. Go over to chapter 11. Romans 11. And look with me, if you will, down to verse uh, 26. And again, this whole section, again, 9 through 11 is about Israel. And, and uh, here, here's what he says there. And so all Israel shall be what? Saved. On the basis of what? There will come out of Zion the deliverer and will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Well, the deliverer has already come, but they've not accepted him. But he will return and they will accept him. Verse 27, this is my covenant unto them. That's the covenant we just read about, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. This is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Sins can only be taken away. They can only be dealt with on the basis of the shed blood, death, burial, resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not church membership. It's not being a Jew. It's not being a Gentile. It's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is where they will be brought to. Well, with that in mind, Paul is dealing with the nation of Israel, her rebellion and her position. We noted that Paul had cited Deuteronomy 30. I'm not going to turn to it. But in Deuteronomy chapter 30, Israel is at the borders of the promised land. They have been delivered from Egypt. The first time they came to the promised land, they sent the spies in. Two of the spies says, yeah, the cities are walled, the people are big, but we can take them because God's on our side. And the other ten spies said, no way. We go in there, they're going to wipe us out. We can't go. Sometimes it doesn't take but just a little bit of negativity to kind of water things right down. Ten of them were negative. And the people start moaning and crying and groaning and saying, oh, we can't do it, we can't do it. And God says, fine. You don't want to trust me? Give me some laps. And say, so they, they, 40 years laps around the desert. 40 years of laps. That crowd, anyone over 20, except for Caleb and Joshua, has died off. So you've got the new crowd coming in. Think about this. All of them are 20 and under. Have you ever thought about that? They're just a bunch of youngsters. But they're getting ready to receive the promise that God has given them. And so they're, as they're about to go in the, into the land... God says to them, yep, you're going to go into the land, but I've warned you about obeying me and not obeying me, and you're not going to obey me. And there's going to come a time when after I have scattered you, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 1, after I have scattered you among all the nations of the world, when I will draw you back. Now, why was God going to draw them back to himself and draw them back to his land? On what basis? Was that on the basis of their own righteousness? Never. Was it on the basis of the fact that they were worth it and they were, they were a really good choice? No. It was on the basis of God's faithfulness to what he promised he would do. Understand this. When God calls us to himself, it's not about us. It's about him. It's about his grace 
his love, his mercy. If we start thinking it's about us, we're in trouble. But boy, we're in that culture, aren't we? I want it my way. I don't know when that started, the song, you know. But that's how we want to do things. We want to do that way in church. We want a church that focuses on my needs and makes me feel good about myself. It's interesting. God never really focused on that when the prophets came. When the prophets came and spoke to Israel, it's like, now, how can we make you feel good? It's like, no, I'm going to tell you what God says. And sometimes it was a message of encouragement because I'm going to bring you back. But sometimes he blasted them. You guys are stubborn, and Paul's blasting them right now. Someone who tells you a lie to make you feel good is not your friend. Someone who lovingly tells you the truth, even when they know it will hurt, that's a person who will stick. See, we don't want anything painful. We want everything happy. Well, anyhow. He says they'll be scattered among all the nations. That didn't happen with the Babylonian captivity. It didn't happen with the Assyrian captivity. It, it, it did not happen with uh, the uh, oppression by the Greeks and all that went on there. That did not happen until after they rejected her Messiah. When Israel rejected her Messiah, Rome sacked the city, destroyed the temple, destroyed Jerusalem, and drove the Jews out among all the nations of the world because she rejected her Messiah. And so, so Paul's dealing with all of this. But Moses gave them this message. God gave them this message through Moses even before they entered the land for the very first time. See, God was not surprised by any of it. God knew what was going to happen. And God always knows what's going to happen. So whatever comes into our life that surprises us, that we didn't expect, that we did not anticipate, understand this, God knew it before he spoke the words, let there be light. God knew it. And if God has chosen something to come into our lives that we don't understand and we don't like, we need to just rest in him because he's in charge, not us. And he knows what's going on, not us. But when something happens we don't like, boy, we tend to want to take our toys and go home, don't we? I don't know how many of y'all follow. I'm using Facebook to try and encourage people. Uh, but but I, I saw a Facebook, Facebook post someone else had a couple weeks ago, and I had to put it on my page. And basically it says, I'm tired of being a grown-up, and I quit. And if anybody wants me, I'll be in my blanket fort coloring. <laughs> Do you ever feel that way about life? It's like, this is not what I expected. It's not what I planned. It's not what I anticipated. I'm just going to go to my blanket fort in color. The reality is we can stay in the midst of it all because as we cling tightly to him, and of course, even if we're not holding tightly to him, he's still got tightly to us. So we just faithfully continue on and we faithfully serve because he knows what's going on. And he told them this. Before, before they even entered the land, that they were going to be scattered. This was probably about 1,400 years before Jesus came. God told them, you guys, you guys are going to mess up. You're going to be scattered. And now it's been 2,000 years, and you know what's happening? As a nation, not spiritually, but as a nation, they are returning to their land from all over the world. You think that makes the devil happy? No, he's after them with all of, his, all of his Muslim people over there. Incidentally, Muslim is not the same thing as Christianity. Islam is not the same thing as Christianity. They don't worship the same God. They don't understand the concept of his mercy and grace. They're all about violence. And the reason that they're not violent in this country is because there's not enough of them. When they hit 3 or 4 or 5% of a population, that starts to change. Look at Europe. And when they're a majority of the population, they behead women in the streets. So they are not the same thing. The response of Christianity is love and grace and mercy, period. Biblical Christianity. In any case, let's get back to where we were. We get to the point in our lives, we only want to hear about the happy stuff. 
We only want to hear about the blessings. We only want to hear about the miracles. We only want to hear about those things that encourage us. And Paul is saying, Israel, what you are getting right now is exactly what you asked for. Not only that, God did not change his plan. This is what God told you was going to happen 1,400 years ago. Because he knew your stubborn and rebellious heart. Nobody likes to hear that. You want to create a problem. You walk up to someone and says, you are so stubborn. I am not. <laughs> Why are you yelling? I'm not yelling. You know, I mean, it's just, you want to start an argument, you come up and accuse them of being stubborn and rebellious. And so Paul's kind of letting them have it. He's not telling them. See, but again, just like Israel, we think it's all about us, don't we? When in reality, it's all about him. Always has been. His glory, his grace, his love. It's never about us. Israel thought it was about them, and so they were, they were upset. All right, well, as we come to verse 14, you didn't think we were going to get there. Here we are, verse 14. Three questions. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Basically, the question summary is, is, is this. How can they be saved if they don't know? How can they be saved if they don't know? And, and that's the thought. And so Paul is anticipating their objection, that they're going to say, well, we, we, we didn't know. And Paul says, are you kidding? In these three chapters, I believe it's over 30 times Paul quotes the Old Testament. You know why? He's building his case. He's saying, this is not new for me. I'm not making this up. Moses told you this. For you even came into the land. Elisha told you this. David told you this. Isaiah told you this. Jeremiah told you this. Like, wake up and smell the coffee. This is not something new. And they failed to get it. Well, we noted one more thing I do want to hit. This is their biggest failure. They failed to understand that their own righteousness was not enough. They thought their own righteousness was enough. And it was never enough. Go back to chapter 9 and look at the last couple of verses there. Pick up in, um, pick up in 29, 929. Except the Lord had, had left us, the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed. Again, the idea of a remnant. Unless God had, had saved a few of us, we'd been like Sodom and Gomorrah. Anybody go on the map and show me where Sodom and Gomorrah is, was, no. We don't even know where it was. God wiped them up out so bad, we don't even know where they used to be. And so he says, except for God's grace, we'd be like that. And guess what? That's true for every one of us. Do you understand that? If it wasn't for God's grace, we wouldn't matter. And once we die, we'd be gone and that would be it and nobody would ever know and nobody would ever care. So he says, we, we'd be like that. He goes on. What about this? The Gentiles, verse 30, the Gentiles, they, they didn't pursue righteousness, and yet they've attained righteousness. Last part of verse 30, even the righteousness which is of faith. Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, this is the law of righteousness, the idea is they're keeping the law. They were trying to be righteous by keeping the law. They pursued that diligently, intently. They pursued that righteousness. But what's he say there? They didn't attain to it. They didn't make it. Wherefore, why not? Verse 32. Because they sought it not by what? But as it were of what? By the works of the law. See, and that's what he, he, he continues that in chapter 10. They thought they could make it on their own. There's no way. It's only grace. Shouldn't they have known that? Yeah, they should have. The message was there. The prophets were there. It was clear. All the way back with Abraham. Abraham believed God and his faith in God was counted to him for what? Righteousness. It was not a righteousness by the law. It was a righteousness by faith. We've got to understand that we can never keep the law. We can never do works. We can never do anything good enough to impress God. And yet that's one of the most universal things, I think, in our culture today, the concept of self-righteousness. If I can be good enough in this life, maybe I won't have to come back as a pig. I'm mean, Seriously. I mean, that, that is many, most other world religions other than biblical Christianity has this idea of endless recycling. 
You know what you call a, call a hillbilly who comes back as his coon dog? Reincarnation. <laughs> Anyhow. The, 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 the concept, if I can just be good enough, if I can get it right this time, then maybe I can move into that stage of full enlightenment. Maybe I can reach nirvana. Full consciousness with the mind of the world and everything, and I won't have to keep coming back. I mean, that whole concept. Uh, and that's the, the concept of reincarnation. It's like recycling. We have that today. Recycling. You just come back as a different can, you know? You're never really done. They just take you and melt you down and stamp you into something else. You know, that's not what God says. God says it's appointed on a man once to die and after this, the judgment. That's a biblical pattern. But if we believe that it's based on what we do, I could understand, you know, wanting to keep trying. But that's the mindset. The concept that the greatest thing in all eternity, in all the world, could be free, that we simply receive, goes against everything we've ever been taught. you got to work for it. I don't know, maybe not. They're teaching it more now. That's one of the things that really bugs me about, about the, the kids' sports. You don't have to win. Everybody gets a trophy. Try that in life. Try that on your first job. That bugs me. That bugs me. But once you get to your first job, what you learn is if you're going to get paid, you've got to perform, you've got to work. And so we have this idea that if we're going to have righteousness, we've got to work. It's like, no, because what we could do can never be enough. The only hope for righteousness is faith in Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul is stressing all the way through. Jews didn't get it. All right, so how are we going to hear that gospel? Someone has to tell us. Verse 15. How shall they preach except they be sent? Oh, incidentally, preacher there is not talking about me. Preacher's not talking about the guy who stands and delivers the message. That's what we say. Who's your preacher? That's what we mean. Guess what? Every one of us is a preacher. Okay? The word preach there means to proclaim the truth. It means it's keruso, to, to declare. John the Baptist was a preacher. The apostles were preachers. Certainly, we, we understand that. But every one of us is a preacher. It's not a question of whether you're a preacher or not. The question is what kind of a preacher are you? By the things that you say, by the way that you live your life, by the way that you treat other people, do you preach about the grace and mercy and love of God? Or do you preach about something else? I think sometimes we preach more about his judgment and his hatred. There'll be time for people to deal with that. And, and, and I wouldn't say that you should never talk about that. But people should be drawn by his love and grace and they should see it in us. We'll talk about a little bit more when we get to John 17. When, when, we, when we get a little bit farther along here. Actually, we'll do that right now. How shall they preach except they be, what, verse 15? Except they be sent. Go to John 17. Hold your spot here in Romans. If you're still holding Deuteronomy or, or somewhere else, let go of that. John chapter 17. Upper room discourse, John, and we're studying that on Wednesday night. Had a great time Wednesday night. We didn't follow the passage real well. We had a great time. Some good stuff, good stuff. Great fellowship, great sharing. I'm looking forward to food. I promised tacos the second night. What did I promise the first night? Beef stew first night. I promised roast beef the first night. Is that what I did? Okay. Well, chicken, we have to do chicken spaghetti three. All right, roast beef first Wednesday the fourth, then tacos and burritos. All right. Good. I meant to promise roast uh, beef stew is what I meant to promise. <laughs> all right, all right. Anyhow, how do we get on that? Oh, Wednesday night Bible study. Encourage you all to come. Upper room discourse, John 13 through 17. 17 is the prayer. End of 16, he says, arise, let us be going. They may have prayed this on the way out. They may have stopped at Gethsemane at, at, at the entrance to the garden and prayed this. But Jesus prays this prayer. Look at verse 18. I think that's what we want to start with. Yeah. Here's what he says. John 17, 18. As thou hast sent me, Jesus is praying to his father, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Interesting comparison. Jesus says, Father, you sent me. Just like you sent me, I'm sending them. Men walk in darkness, right? But Jesus is the? He's the light of the world. God sent Jesus to be the light. And Jesus sent us. We are not the light, but we are to reflect that light, aren't we? 
People should look in us, look at us, and they should see a reflection of the Lord Jesus Christ. If they want to know what Jesus is like, they should be able to see it in us if we are reflecting clearly, cleanly, properly. I think of the Lord Jesus. I think of little children who would come to the Lord Jesus. They would just, they would, they would come to him, and the disciples say, get, get away, don't, don't, bother, don't bother the teacher, don't bother Jesus. But Jesus would say, let him come, let him come. Jesus loved the little children. I like to watch how people treat three things, three kinds of people. I like to watch how people treat children. I like to watch how people treat servers. And I like to watch how they treat animals. You watch how people treat children, servers, and animals, and it will tell you an awful lot about them. Now, they might not have been raised around animals. They might have been taught that animals don't belong in the house or whatever. But they should treat those three in a way that reflects the love and grace that we've been shown. It really ticks me off when someone's rough on a waiter or a server. It just really bugs me. Anyone who serves, whether it's at a restaurant. I had a great time with, in the hospital. I, was, I, had, I had a blast telling jokes to the nurses. Because, and, and, I mean, they deal with difficult patients all the time. I mean, there are people who are afraid they're going to die. I mean, they're, some of them are going to die. And they're afraid that they're going to die. Reality is we're all going to die. It's just not yet, maybe. All right? But they're afraid. I went through a couple days there, and based on my diagnosis, I thought I was going to die. I was ready to pick out, you know, do I want a blue casket or, you know, a gray casket? Or, all right? But you know what? I wasn't afraid. You know why? To depart and be with Christ is not just okay. It's not just better, Paul says, Philippians 1.23. It is far better. Far better. So I, I wasn't worried. So I had a great time, even in the middle of all that, cutting up with the nurses and, and, and just, you know, because I wanted to be a positive and they were there to take care of me and all that, but I had a great time passing out cookies. And I'm sorry, I've been talking about that too much lately. I shouldn't, but anyhow, Jesus was the light, and we are sent to be that light. Go down to verse 21. Still 17, John 17, 21. That they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may also be one in us, that the world may, what? Believe that thou hast sent me. You want to know sometimes I think why a lot of people don't believe the message that we preach? It's because we're so focused on fighting about the things we don't agree on that we can't be united in the things that we do agree on. And that doesn't give a very good picture of the light to the world who only knows darkness. Now, I understand we live in a sin-cursed world and there's just going to be some scrapping. That's part of what's going to happen. We're going to, we're going to scrap sometimes. Okay, but we need to get over it and focus on the love and grace of God and the family aspect and serving. Verse 21, that was verse 23. I and them and thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one, perfect, mature, complete, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Sent, that's how we're sent. All right, back to Romans 11. 10. As it is written... Verse 15, I almost titled my message, Happy Feet. Seriously, I almost, almost had Kathy put on the sign, Happy Feet. Romans 10, 15. Here's what it says. How beautiful are the feet of them that, uh, pretty feet might have been better, but happy feet would have been more fun. Anyhow, the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. That's a quote from Isaiah. You know the context on that? The Jews had been in captivity in Babylon, and the message is that they're going to be released to go back. Freedom from captivity. Guess what? Paul applies it to the gospel because you know what the greatest captivity is? To sin and darkness and death. And haven't we all been set free from that by the grace and power and love of God? And so Paul applies it. Good tidings. Good news. Happy feet. All right. But they've not all obeyed. Verse 16, they've not all obeyed. Isaiah says, Lord, who's believed our report? Quote from Isaiah 53, 1. In these 11 verses, 
Paul cites the Old Testament eight times. Eight Old Testament quotes in 11 verses. That's from verse 11 to 21. We started in 14, but there were a couple above that, so I counted those two because they were close. They, who's believed? They've not believed. Verse 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the? Did they have the word of God? Yes. God gave it to them through Moses. God gave them the commandments. They wrote it down. They memorized it. They hid it in their heart. They should know it. So when it came to knowing what to do or what to believe or where to go, God had given it to them. Then later God sent the prophets and gave them more messages, gave them more truth about himself. And yet, what did they do when the prophets came? You recall Jesus' story of the, of the guy who was a landowner? The guy was the landowner. He owned the farm, and he hired tenant farmers, and the tenant farmers were to work it out. And so as they worked the land, he would send someone every year or a couple of years, and they were supposed to receive the rent. And the rent would have been a portion of the harvest. And so the first guy they sent, they killed him. Next guy they sent, they killed him. Finally, the son came. He sent his son, and he said, they'll reverence my son. They didn't reverence the messengers, but this guy's my son. They'll reverence him. And what did they do? They killed the son, too. And they thought, well, we kill the son, then there's nobody to inherit. We'll get it. What they didn't understand was when they killed the son, they fully enraged and fully set in motion the wrath of the father, and the wrath of the father sent the soldiers, and they came and killed them. And you see the picture of the nation of Israel. They killed the prophets, they rejected the prophets, and finally they killed the son. And the message is, you think you're going to get away with that? And the answer is no, they're not going to get away with that. So Israel, stubborn, rebellious, under God's judgment. They had the word of God. Go to verse 18. Interesting. See, see if you, without looking at your notes, well, it's not, it's not a common enough quote, you probably won't recognize it. We'll go back and look at it. I say, Paul says, I say, didn't they hear? Didn't they have the word of God? Shouldn't they know? Haven't they heard? Their sound went into all the earth, their words unto the ends of the world. Hold your spot here. Go back to Psalm, just a second. I think it's 19, verse 4. Psalm 19, 4. For the most part, if you open about to the middle of your Bible, you're going to be pretty close to Psalms. Psalm 19.4, and this is, the, this is the reference. We'll go back and get the verse ahead of that. Their line is gone out through all the earth, their words to the end of the world. That's the quote. Through all the earth, their words to the end. What is that? Look at verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. What is that? Day, night, creation, the heavens declaring the glory. Doesn't that take us right back to Romans chapter 1? All things are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. How is that? Through creation. God's creation reveals that. And so he goes all the way back to that. They should have known from creation, and yet they didn't. They should have known more specifically because of all the prophets and because of all the word that God sent to them, but they didn't. You know what? We won't hear what we don't like. I recall hearing, see if I can get this right. No, I'm not even going to take time. But we sometimes have selective hearing. Did Israel do that? Yeah. The message was repent. They didn't want that message. They wanted the message of a Messiah who is going to come in, drive out the Romans, and give them their kingdom. And again, it's back. We want what we want. You want to know what will pack a crowd into a church? Fill it up. You want to know what will? Happy messages. God is so good. You are so good. He will give you money and he will heal you and make you better and your life will just be wonderful. I mean, who doesn't want to hear that? Anybody here need more money? I, it was funny. The, the, uh, Josiah showed me his wallet. He had a wallet. Showed me his wallet. He was oldest. I was mixing him up. Ace is, Ace is oldest, yeah. Josiah showed me his wallet. Ace's birthday Saturday. 
Josiah showed me his wallet, and I said, oh, that's cool. And I opened up, there was nothing, and I pulled, I, I pulled out a dollar, put the dollar in it. This is Josiah. Asa saw this, and he comes running, I've got a wallet too. <laughs> Fortunately, I had another one. I gave him one. Ziva saw this, sees this, and I said, okay, so she got her purse. And she got a dollar. I looked up, and there's Charles and Cynthia standing there with their purse and their wallet. He's like, yeah, okay, all right. Give me more money. And, and, and you know what? You know the way that they promise you're going to get more money is if you give them more. Yeah, that's the thing about these churches. You ever, I don't know if you ever watched them or if you ever been to them. It's like you got to have seed faith. If you believe God, you got to give me the seed, then God will give you more. It's kind of interesting. How come you give me the seed, but God's going to give you more? I'm not sure how I do that math on that. But the idea is you give us the money and you show God you believe in him and he'll give you more. I, I always want to go back to the, to the words of that famous scholar and philosopher, Dr. Phil. How's that working out for you? You know, uh, you know, really, really, you know, because it's not true. It is not true. God may not want you to be wealthy. In fact, let me just take that a step farther. If God wanted you to be wealthy, you may be wealthy. Maybe God did want you wealthy. If God wanted me to be wealthy, guess what I would be? Okay, but this concept that God wants everybody healthy, wealthy, and happy, that's a lie. But it's a popular lie. And if you tell it smoothly enough, a lot of people will come hear it particularly if you get some pop psychology thrown in there about how to deal with your depression, your anxiety, and all that kind of stuff, and just believe you're happy. I mean, that's back to happy feet. Sorry, I should have stuck with that. All right, continue in the passage. God says, all of creation should have told them. Verse 19, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. I'm sorry, I'm back in Romans. I didn't mean to leave you in Psalm 14 if you're there. Back to Romans 11. I know, sometimes I change pages too fast for me too. 10, yes, thank you, Romans 10. We're almost to 11, a few more verses. We'll be there next week, God willing. I'll provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. By a foolish nation, I will anger you. And he goes again all the way back to Deuteronomy, quoting Moses. What he basically says is the time will come when the Gentiles will hear me and you won't. We just read 9. Go back to the last couple of verses of verse 9. Gentiles, which followed, verse 30. Gentiles followed not after righteousness, they attained to it. They weren't even looking for it, but they got it. Israel was not just looking for it, they were pursuing it. They didn't get it. You want to know why? Because grace and works. You don't find righteousness of God except by grace. Through Jesus Christ. You can work and work and work and work and work your rear end off. I couldn't think of anything else to say. You can work till you, till you work your fingers to the bone and you will never earn the righteousness that God requires. The only way to receive it is like that dollar in the wallet. It's got to be a gift. No conditions, no strings. Here it is, and we receive it, the grace of God. To as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name, John 1, 12. It's a gift. It's a gift. They didn't get it. They didn't get it. Verse 20, Isaiah is very bold. I was found in them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. Verse 21, to Israel he saith. I'm sorry, I'm back in Romans 11. Verse 21, to yeah, 10, thank you, Romans 10. I'm trying to get ahead. To Israel, he saith, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people, stubborn, rebellious, disobedient. See, it's God's sovereignty, but it's also our response. Got to balance those two out perfectly. But Israel wanted to do it their way. I can be good enough. I'm going to keep the law. And God says, you ain't going to make it like that. You never will. But the Gentiles will. 
And we'll get to that more in chapter 11, when we finally do get to chapter 11. All right? But we rest in His grace. That's all there is. That's the only hope. And Israel refused to do it God's way. I don't know what God's doing in your life, but the reality is in most of our lives, there's things that are going on that we'd rather not do it that way. I mean, is everybody here happy about everything in your life? I'm happy. I got, my son-in-law helped me fix, well, he fixed my truck. I've helped him a little bit. I'm driving my green truck this morning. I am so happy. That's the only thing in my life this morning. I got up and went out there and turned on them bright headlights and gotten up in my truck high where I could see all the critters and all the other little vehicles on the road. And I was so excited to drive my truck to church this morning. I was so excited. But the town car, it needs some work. <laughs> I mean, I don't, it's only got 204,000 miles on it. It might have rolled over five since I last looked at it. All right. Not everything in my life is everywhere where I would like it to be. Okay? And if everything in your life is exactly as you'd like it to be, then, I mean, I'm happy for you. Okay? Yeah, you better, you better watch out because your turns are coming. All right? Here, here's the truth. Here's the truth. God is working in our lives to cause us to depend more on Him. We were in John 15. I'm not going to turn to it because I'm wrapping up here. In John 15, about verse 2, he says, The branch in me that bears more fruit, I prune it, I purge it, I cut it back. If everything in our life was happy, you know what? We wouldn't need Jesus. We wouldn't need to depend on God at all, would we? We would just kind of be coasting along all on our own. Paul 2 Corinthians chapter 12, it starts in about verse 6 or 7. He says, I beg God three times, take away the thorn. God says, nope. And then he says this, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. You know what? The struggles that we have, those burdens that we have, when we come to him, we cast ourselves on his mercy and grace. And you know what? He catches us all the time. He catches us all the time. Marty was telling me about his grandkids. They, they were down in Columbus, and I don't remember which one of the boys it was, but he was there in the, in the, in the driveway, and there's a, like a little retaining wall he's got. I don't know, it's four or five feet tall. And one of the grandsons ran up on that wall, looks at Marty, and jumps. Fortunately, Marty was paying attention, and he caught him. I want to tell you this. God is always paying attention, and every time we jump, he'll catch us. The problem is we hold too close to the wall, and we want to do it our way. And the reality is we need to cast ourselves on him, because every time, every time, his grace is sufficient. How sad that Israel was resting in her own strength in what she understood in what she could do her way. May we learn the lessons that Israel hadn't caught on to yet. That God's way is the best way, whether we understand it, whether we like it or not. And if we will just rest in him, walk with him, his grace is sufficient. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for the lessons of Israel. Yet I acknowledge that so often the lessons of Israel are the lessons of my own life. How you've told us, you've told me, and I didn't listen. And I'm going to do it my way. And I'm going to rest in my own strength. Father, I thank you that you are teaching me a little bit at a time that you will always catch me. I pray, God, as, a, as individuals and as a church family, we will rest in you. And that we will understand that oftentimes you use us to catch each other. We are your hands. But never, never will those who trust in you be put to shame. Never will we be ashamed for having our confidence in you. Keep us safe as we go. May we walk in your grace. 
In Jesus' name, amen.